In the workshop, part four of a diabolical model steam engine. The piston and rod are unserviceable items for obvious reasons, and in this episode I show the primary reason why the engine could not possibly work. In the previous episode I showed this clip of the piston and rod, and you can see what's wrong with it at both ends. I also showed this other piece of metal because I was considering machining a new piston rod from this. There is one minor problem, well there are many problems with the engine, but there's one minor problem with the piston rod fit into the crosshead. The piston rod is supposed to be quarter of an inch in diameter, but the hole in the crosshead is a bit bigger than that. I decided against the complexity of machining the piston rod from another piece of steel, leaving it a bit bigger at one end to fit into the crosshead. With this engine I really have to be careful not to go into obsess mode. By the way, the purpose of this video for the viewers that write in from time to time is not just to criticise the maker. And besides, I'm not doing that in the first place. I just have to assess the mechanical condition. And I can't say, oh look at this, it's a beautiful piece of engineering. It's not a piece of putrescent excrement after all. I couldn't care less who built the engine, I'm just taking it on face value. Here once again, because it's such a great piece of engineering, is the motion bracket. It was originally fabricated and soft soldered together, but then it broke, and it looks to me to have been repaired about three times, and I'm about to repair it, possibly for a fourth time. This next part of the video shows why the engine could not possibly work, and here it is. The gland is fitted the wrong way round. The bit that sticks out should really stick into the large hole on the inside. But someone who doesn't really appreciate how steam engines work has put it together this way. This cannot possibly work. All that happens is the valve fork hits the bit sticking out and everything jams solid. Then the subsequent force used to attempt to turn over the engine has just broken everything. The motion bracket worst of all. In this clip I've removed the gland cover and here I'm getting rid of this graphited yarn. There's an awful lot of it because the gland was fitted the wrong way around, so there was a large void on the other side of the gland. As well as damage to other parts of the engine, the valve rod is also bent. I need to straighten this. Here is the valve rod, or the part of it that's bent, sticking out of my Myford ML 7 hours chuck. And by spinning it you can see just how bent it is. I'm going to use a really effective scientific method to fix this. It's called the gentle use of a soft hammer. And where do you hit it? Well, in the opposite way to which it's bent. I'm now about to reassemble this part of the engine, but this time I'm putting the gland cover in place the correct way around. With the protruding part now down inside the hole in the steam chest. I should really make new parts for this, but it's insult to injury. If you look at the way it's made, I have to go with what I've got to play with. As I mentioned in the previous episode, I would not normally even look at an engine like this. In this clip, for the packing, I'm using some O-rings. If this is not successful, I will use some graphited yarn. In retrospect, wrapping graphited yarn around the valve rod would possibly be a better idea, because it would support it. The hole through this unit is much larger than the shaft that goes in it. For the moment though, I'm going to live with the O-rings and see whether they work or not. Every part that I repair, or make, and fit to the engine, has to be of the same manufacturing tolerance that I'm currently having to work with. With the exception of the piston and rod, all of the components I'm using, I'm hoping, are going to be the original ones. It's looking much better already. Now when I move the valve fork on the end of the valve rod, the slide valve uncovers the ports equally at both ends. Now it's time to look at the piston rod gland cover. This is held in place by two nuts on two studs. But first I'm going to have a look at the technical specification of the original piston and rod. Apart from the damage to the piston rod at the crosshead end in an attempt to make it work, look how much of the piston rod thread is sticking out of the piston. This arrangement is definitely not going to be a good thing for the gland packing. 
The piston rod on this engine is supposed to be a quarter of an inch in diameter and here my micrometer tells me that the piece of stainless steel I'm about to use is a quarter of an inch in diameter. I'm going to compare it with the original piston rod and here the micrometer tells me that it's two thou down and that's on the part of the piston rod that doesn't rub up against anything, it's just the part that sticks into the crosshead. Once again, using the micrometer, I measure the diameter of the piston rod, but this time it's where it goes through the gland. And this is good news. The piston rod is worn. This would suggest to me that at some time in the life of this engine, it had actually run. Now in the next part of the job, I'm removing the gland cover from the front of the cylinder. This is actually fitted the correct way around. That is, of course, before it was dismantled and incorrectly reassembled by someone who didn't know what they were doing. So far, with the exception of the wood screw crudely fitted into one of the holes, all of the fixings are OK, although they are a little bit tight. Any fixings that I replace on this engine during the rebuild will be replaced by 5BA and 4BA, depending on which ones they are. Most of these threads are very tight on 5BA. In this clip I'm removing the valve packing and this is really very old and very dry. It fell to bits as I pulled it out. When I initially repack the gland I'm going to use a couple of O-rings. Why use more than one? Well it's something to do I believe with the tolerance of the manufacturer. Even fitting two O-rings may be insufficient. Because all the fits on this engine are what could be described as rattle fits. This is my usual tin of recycled standard thinners. I recycle it for a limited period until it becomes oily, then it's no good. And here I'm pouring some of the contents of the tin into a polythene tub. It should be clear, it's not clear because this has been used for removing paint. I'm going to use this cellulose thinners or lacquer thinner to thoroughly clean the motion bracket and the crosshead guides before soldering them back together. In the next episode, I will be making a new piston and rod. Here, I'm just obtaining the dimensions, and I'm going to cut the rod to length, which is four inches, from this piece of stainless steel. After attacking the rod with my bandsaw, it now looks like this in two parts. I've purposely cut this rod slightly oversized to allow for machining of the ends. I'm thinking what to do about the size of the hole in the crosshead. I have one or two ideas. But that's it for now. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.